and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Jo Elvin and with me to discuss the latest royal news is the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, the Mail on Sunday's editor-at-large, Charlotte Griffiths, and in between them, the Daily Mail's diary editor, Richard Eden. I've been told not to make any rows between two thorns jokes, so I, so I won't. Um, but anyway, so welcome to all our viewers as well. And just like last week, we will be reading some of your comments and answering your questions a bit later on in the show. Look forward to that. So much to discuss this week, including the so-called Sussex Survivors squad try and say that quickly and the eye-opening revelations from two new royal books but I want to start in Wales where a new prince and princess were very warmly welcomed and Rebecca English you were there and people were pleased to see them but there's no apparently no royal investiture coming yeah, I slept up to Swansea. They were in two places, Hollyhead, uh, which is on Anglesey, where they spent actually some of their early years of their married life, and then to Swansea. So they were doing kind of both sides of the country. And um, it was a really warm welcome because, of course, although they announced they were going to be there, they don't say the times for security reasons, but still word got out. And there were, well, I I'd say hundred. I mean, I couldn't even begin to count on these kind of tiny little streets around a, a church in Swansea, and um, everyone was like genuinely pleased to see them, and they and they really got stuck in, shaking as many hands as they could, posing for selfies, you know, chatting with the kids. They, they, you know, nothing was too much trouble, um, and, and it was very clear that they wanted to make a mark as a new prince and princess of Wales at the first day after. Royal morning ends, they were actually in this country where mm. they've been given this title and this association. And I'm told they're going to go back there before Christmas. It's, it's really something they want to, to forge and to blossom, that relationship with Wales. Mm. Um, but as you rightly say, um, we've been told no big investiture. Obviously, the, uh, the old Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, had a very big investiture in 1969. Um, and William definitely doesn't want to do that. It's not out of disrespect it's I mean they cost a lot of money these things and it was just different very times. Very grand wasn't it? It was yeah. and it's just you know I think the feeling is it's it's the relationship between him and the country that's important not these kind of big grand gestures and it's just different times now as someone said to me. So. Bit of a downer though isn't it Richard? I, I really think it is it yeah. just seems kind of apologetic <laughs> like yeah. yes I'm now yeah. Prince of Wales but I'm not going to celebrate it. You should you know the original ceremony the 1969 one was at Carnarvon Castle and it was a real coming of age of events for um, then Prince Charles. And he learnt Welsh for the occasion. Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think for William and Catherine to be the new Prince and Princess of Wales, you know, it's a really proud moment. I, I went to university in Wales myself at Swansea. So I, I know, I know how... They let anyone in down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're very, you know, they're big yeah. royalists. And I think that it's, it's something to celebrate. And as with other aspects like the coronation, um, we should make a big thing about it, and it's part of the heritage, and there's no need to feel apologetic about it. We mentioned heritage. Did you know the, the, the crown that um, Prince Charles was invested in in 1969 was actually made out of a ping pong ball? What? <laughs> no, so, 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 this, is, this is a true, fun, royal fact. I interviewed the guy who made it. They wanted it to be modern and not old. So they, um, they had this new kind of electro-magno plating thing, I can't remember the exact name, but they couldn't work out how to make the, the orb at the middle of it. And the guy came up with the idea, let's use a ping pong ball. That crown is weird looking when you look back at it now. Was it was futuristic modern. 60s. But why was this not an entire episode of The Crown? That's the I don't yeah. think people realise this. I interviewed the guy years ago and I couldn't quite believe it, but I, he showed me the doc. I'm not, you know, I've seen it all. And, uh, well, come I on, it shows that it wasn't such a lavish ceremony after all. Yeah. 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 I'll be glad not to see that crown again on Prince William. He'd look ridiculous in it. And in the ermine cape and with the big ruby oh, ring. Oh, I loved it because it, it was... Imagine Prince William, he's 40 years old. You know, Charles was 20. He'd I know, ridiculous. because when, if you think about... You know, when you're a kid and you think of fairy stories with kings and queens, that's what it looked like. That's what I loved about all of that. Um, yeah. Remember the Order of the Garter ceremony where, um, you know, William has to wear the long the velvet robes and, and Catherine's always kind of teasing him about it. But it's fun. That's part of but the it's, it's 2022. Up. He's a modern man. You know, do you remember when he wore the polo neck and the velvet jacket to Earthshot? Even that looked a bit weird. Uh, we kind of <laughs> teased him for it. I just don't think a modern man who we're used to seeing for many, many years in suits would look right in the basically a third dress. Well, bring on, bring on the modern. camp. Bring it on. Yeah. Don't <laughs> you think, Charlotte, do you think it, it heralds in a new phase where 
we all hate that word optics, but they are thinking of that. They've, they're going to have to balance in this cost of living crisis, totally. look, looking royal and grand with the realities of what most people are going through and, and perceiving. Yeah, I think optics are the, the very centre of all plans, for the coronation as well. They really don't want to look ostentatious. They don't want anyone else to even spend money. They don't really want people spending lots of money on morning suits to wear to the coronation. They're really thinking about that kind of thing on every level. And so I think, yeah, fair enough for a coronation, which will be pared back, which we know. But to have the investiture completely over the top, costing millions of pounds at a time like this, I just don't think it would sit right. Optics are everything. Let's move on. Um, Rebecca, you've just come this morning from another moving ceremony or another moving event. Can you, wh where have you been? Well, yeah, so today they've reopened um, Windsor Castle for the first time after Royal Morning has finished. And uh, so the members of the public can go in. Of course, part of the tour, if you, if you pay for a ticket to go to Windsor Castle, it includes St George's Chapel in which the King George VI Memorial um, Chapel is where the Queen's been laid to rest. And I just bought my ticket like a, 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 a it's a charity and I feel like we should support them at times like this. They've had a tough time the last few years due to COVID and I went and um, I mean the crowds are going around the corner but it's actually it calmed down and you could get into the um, chapel very quickly. But Once I you got past Philip and Holly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I have to say it was really moving even though we didn't spend you couldn't really dwell on it you had to walk but it's it's so tiny and intimate this chapel it's you know you're surrounded by kind of grand sarcophaguses everywhere mm. and yet you've got something that's really family orientated and you can see all the wreaths there and they're just starting to wilt a little bit you know like you, you would if you went back a week later after your grandmother had died and the flowers are still on her grave and I, I found it really moving and actually when you go back out you walk past the entrance to the Royal Vault which is a big slab in the floor of St George's Chapel and normally it has a kind of cord around it and when they want to use the chapel they kind of pull the cord out of the um out of the sides of the uh, the marble slabs and it can move and then you can see how they haven't replaced it so you can still see a little bit of chipping around mm. it so you re it really hits you that this has been very very recently used wow. and I, I'm not gonna lie I had a little bit of a tear in my eyes and walked out I thought it was really really I, moving. I have to say for all our royal fans who watch from around the country and around the world if you are into royal Windsor Castle is it's an amazing place to visit, isn't it? Mm. That chapel's beautiful. Mm. But let's move on now, Richard. We're going to turn to one of the royal books that I mentioned at the top of the show, hitting the headlines, Katie Nichols' book, The New Royals, with some big revelations in there, including the Queen saying of Harry and Meghan's exit from the royal family, something I relate to hugely. I don't care. I don't know. I don't care. And I don't want to think about it anymore. <laughs> what, what, how credible do we think this is? Um, well, I think that quote was made to the Queen's great friend and cousin, um, Lady Elizabeth Anson. And she's quoted quite extensively in, in the book. Um, she is now dead. She died during the pandemic mm. a couple of years ago. Um, but she was... Um, yeah, definitely. Very credible source. I mean, one of the things I found most interesting in, in the book was um, about the run up to Harry and Meghan's wedding. Um, she talked, well, she relates how the Queen actually said that Harry was behaving in a beastly way, that he was just being so difficult about all the arrangements that it was really... Is this that tiara uh, again? Yeah, all of yeah. that business of the tiara and yeah. the arrangements in general, that sort of what Meghan wants, Meghan gets, that type of thing. And, and she had expressed her frustration about this to Lady Elizabeth, and um, Katie Nicholl reports that in the, in the book. Gosh, and Charlotte, there's an interesting insight as well, isn't there, in the potential jealousy of, on William's part over roles for Meghan and Harry. What's that all about? Yeah, she gives a bit of an insight into how much fast-tracking went on to make Meghan and Harry feel special and included before the wedding, including making them very senior in the, in the Commonwealth Trust. And Katie reports that this was a plum role that William quite fancied for himself. Um, and I can imagine the frustration William must have been feeling given that they felt so left out. But all these, all these special measures were being put in place to make them feel really included. And yet they're so resentful that they weren't being made to feel welcome. But as Katie reports, things were being fast-tracked left, left, right and centre, even things that William had his eye on. Um, but then again, in the end, he'll end up head of the Commonwealth anyway, won't he? Potentially. Will, will he? Well, it's, it's a bit of a moot point, isn't it? Because, of course, the Queen ensured that Charles could be head of the Commonwealth. Um, mm. 
and that part of the succession was sorted. But William himself said when we were in the Caribbean earlier on this year, you know, let's see what happens in the future. Mm. It doesn't have to be this way. But I think whatever happens, the royal family will have a very close link with the Commonwealth moving yeah. forward, even if a member of the British family is not head of it. I mean, um, it's part yeah. and parcel of what it is. I'm mm. surprised William felt slightly insecure because, you know, ultimately he's going to be king and very, very important and integral to the royal family. So maybe some of the lesser roles... I'm amazed he was sort of worried about missing out on them. But And the other fascinating thing, Rebecca, is Katie writing about the new Queen Consort's influence and somehow sometimes that she is the one who's calling the shots. I mean, yeah, she, she's a hugely um, influential figure within the King's set up, not only as his wife, but she's got a great deal of common sense as well. Um, and I think she's definitely a foot for him in the real world. Someone once said to me, she brings the real world into his life, because obviously... Whether he likes it or not. not exactly. Yeah. As, you know, as Prince yeah. of Wales and as King, you know, he's never done his own shopping. You know, he's not travelled on the tube privately. All the things that Camilla did before she married into the royal family. So she does, and I remember one very senior courtier saying to me once, you know, if you felt like the door was being slightly slammed in your face from him, you would go to her and she'd kind of look at you enigmatically and say, leave it with me. Oh my and he goodness. says like, yeah. eight times out of 10, it, it shall be done. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So imagine that. That is fascinating. Yeah. We will be discussing Katie Nichols' book in greater depth with the author herself in a special episode of Palace Confidential, and that will be out for you on Monday. We'll turn to the big revelations in Valentine Lowe's new book in just a moment, but let's take a quick look at some of your comments now because we do enjoy this very much. And the first is following our discussion of Prince Harry's forthcoming memoirs. And Savitri Pereira says... Let Harry publish this book and be done with it. You can't allow that to dominate any decisions the king wishes to take. And on the topic of who can handle family matters on behalf of Charles, Kiernan says, in my humble opinion, it seems Anne would be a viable, quote-unquote, replacement for Philip in handling ma family matters. She has the right temperament for the job, and as the second eldest sibling of the king, she is the only one that could, be, that could put Andrew and Harry in their place. Do you agree with that, Charlotte? Totally agree with that. <laughs> Who would mess with Anne? When he says the right temperament for the job, yeah. does he mean total battle axe, <laughs> grumpy? Yeah. But I love her for it, by no the way. No nonsense. And yeah. aren't we missing that from Prince Philip, that no nonsense? I, I don't know if you've ever seen, but there's a video where Prince Anne trips and falls as she walks down a street, and a kindly bishop helps her to her feet. And she tells him off and says, I can get up on my, by myself, thank you very much. Wow. Yeah. That's the kind of thing we need. I think we need someone to knock some of their heads together. I'm thinking Harry here, I'm probably thinking Andrew. And um, yeah, we need that in the royal family. Mm, there you have it. There's something for you to think about, officials at the palace. Well, Doon Watts is following up on our conversation about which of our panellists would make good neighbours. And somehow I'm still not getting a look in here. She says, Andrew Pierce living next door, my dream come true. No, really. Because, you know, because we're all going, really? Try sharing an office with him. <laughs> well, what can you tell us? Actually, he's great. He's, he's, he, well, he, he is, as you can imagine him, he's a total source of gossip. And he is kind a of source of gossip. around the newsroom and, you know, yes. sprinkling little stardust as he goes. We, we always him. see him when he wants his eyebrows look, looking at with our vacant makeup artist, Werner. So that's, we, love, we love Andrew. <laughs> Do keep those comments coming in. We'll probably get, I'll probably get a, get a slap in the face for that I from Andrew later on. I said that. <laughs> We'll be answering a few of your questions a bit later on in the show. Let's turn now to Courtiers, a new book by Valentine Lowe that has been getting royal watchers very excited indeed. And Rebecca, he follows up on reports that you made on the so-called Sussex Survivors Squad. Say it slowly. I know, I have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I wrote about that... A year, a year, a couple of years ago, and I do think Val's book is excellent, I have to say. I think it's very well sourced, very well written and very authoritative. And it, I mean, I must stress the whole book, as Val tells me, who is a, you know, a colleague and friend, is it's not just about the Sussexes. Um, it goes back, I think, to Queen Victoria's time. It's talking about the role of courtiers throughout history. But clearly, everyone is fascinated by what's been happening the last few years because, of course, the courtiers have played a big part in this because at times they have been the go-betweens between Harry and his family members and at times Harry <laughs> feels, has been, yeah. as feel, as feels has been... He very strongly feels they were the block between him and getting to the Queen. Um, uh, and there's a, lot, there's a lot of revelations in it about, you know, the, the Sussexes' frustrations and actually how the palace saw them. Um, and I think... 
I've always said with them, you pay your money, you take your choices as to whose side you fall on. But I, I, I think it's a good book and it's a good mm. read. It's also a bit depressing, isn't it, Richard, that when we like real insight into the, the tension between Harry and William and, and William's failed attempts to even get to speak to Harry at times. There really are some eye-opening um, disclosures in the book and, and one of them is what happened after the broadcast of that ITV documentary. It was Tom Bradby. Oh, that interview with Megan. It was a programme that was meant to be all about their tour of Africa, focusing on these um, regions and the problems they've got there. But it turned out to be all about mm. Harry and particularly Megan. It's the one where she made the comment about nobody's asked about how I am. Mm. Um, and anyway, so after this was broadcast, William was very upset, apparently, very astonished, really, to see the mindset, to see how, you know, I mean, Harry had been asked about his relationship with William and he'd said, made a comment about... Oh, we're on we're, different we're on paths, different paths yeah. that kind of, It yeah. was really stark, you know, nothing we'd heard before in public. And um, William was shocked and the first thing he wanted to do is, you know, go and see his brother and talk about it. So he made contact and Harry wanted to know you know, who would come with you, you know, who would, um, who would need to know about you coming here? And William had to say, well, I'd have to tell my private secretary because I'll have to change my arrangements for tomorrow. And he said, well, if anyone else knows about it, don't come. I mean, and that really is an insight into sort of para yeah, paranoia so almost, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And, and the concerns, you know, just that level of distrust that there was by that point. Yeah. And you can tell that they really were on their way out of the royal family by then. I mean, I was told William did watch that program because he saw it at the same time we all saw it. You know, they weren't given any special preview of it. And he watched it genuinely horrified and actually really upset and really worried about his brother. I mean, it was put out at the time that, you know, he was angry, but that wasn't my understanding at all. I heard that as he, well, he that he was, was genuinely almost in yeah, tears. Yeah. And, and the whole thing has been genuinely upsetting because mm. we always hear this narrative that William's tough and angry, but I've heard as well that actually he's, he's you know, basically cried over it. Do you think he, he actually mm. didn't realise that that's how Harry felt about the relationship? Yeah, I, th I think I think there were some re re revelatory, I should put my teeth back in, aspects for William, but he was actually genuinely concerned kind of about his mental health mm. as well, that he could see, he knew his brother. I mean, they've been, you know, they're brothers who shared a lot together, and I remember interviewing them together years ago when they were sharing a house, and like, we had such a kind of a fabulous chat and the kind of relaxed banter between them. You know, they got on really well. There was lots of jokes about how... Harry didn't pull his weight doing the washing up and who was hogging the video game. And to go from that to, to that, as you say, the level of paranoia and distrust and to see how upset his brother was yeah. had a really, really profound effect on him, what, which what, is why he did reach out and say, the, let's talk. What the book also shows is how difficult it is for the royal family to have normal family-type relationships yes. because of this, where you have to tell people everything you do is monitored, your diary's worked out, yeah. you've got people you have to tell. So it's hard just to sort of pick up the phone and um, or just go and meet your brother as a normal person some wood. But look, it's only a hop down the road. Yeah. Um, mm. And but I think it shows and you yet how, a world away. Yeah, well, exactly. Mm. I think it shows you how 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 bad the relationships were between them. They Gosh. couldn't even have one of those conversations, mm. a quick text message and say, look, let's just let's just sort it out. I couldn't. It wasn't mm. even possible. And mm. Charlotte, we saw more detail, didn't we, on the clash between Meghan and some of her aides, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, Va Valentine Lowe said that they called her a narcissistic sociopath, also quite hard to say, um, which is pretty extreme, and that um, when Amy Pickerel left Meghan's employ, Meghan refused to get in a car with her. There was loads and loads of details about quite how fraught things were. One aide said that she was at a restaurant and every 10 minutes either Harry or Meghan would call. She would have to go outside, take the call, be screamed at, according to this book, and then go back in and try and carry on with her, her dinner without bursting into tears. The chilling Mirandi Priestley quote was the <laughs> sort of like, believe me, if I could find anybody else to do this, I would be... That was I would. so was cutting. <laughs> so, so cold. So cutting. And do you think that's people, true? These are people that had to go out and defend Meghan and Harry and, mm. and, and vouch for them and, and they didn't want to because they were giving them a hard, really hard time. And won't it be fascinating to see if there's legal action against Well, Rebecca, do you, do you think there will be any rebuttal from this from the Sussexes? Well, it's interesting. We've heard nothing over mm. over the Lowe book or the, um, the Bauer book, and that actually surprises me in a way. There's not a peep. Now, I, I don't know what to read into that, whether they 
are not arguing against it because they feel there's too much truth in it or they've decided that discretion is the better part of valour. Polishing the tanks. May, maybe they yeah. don't feel it's appropriate at the moment, obviously, with the, losing the Queen. I, I don't know is the honest answer. Yeah. But they have been unusually quiet and it does make me wonder what's coming around the corner yeah, quite frankly too. well it's interesting as well isn't it Richard Kate Manzi from on the mail on Sunday and a friend of Palace Confidential reported at the weekend that Harry's desperately trying to change some of the details in his forthcoming memoir yes I mean from what I understand the book is is definitely still coming out um, but after the funeral and after well it's basically some of it will be out of date, really. I mean, it's just, you know, it's happened with Katie Nichols' book that because of the death of the Queen, some aspects are already mm. slightly out of date. So he, it would be natural for him to want to update it. But the question is, you know, is it too late? And will he be allowed to make those changes? That that's not clear. None of us really know and what he's going to be allowed to change. Because I would have thought that perhaps it's even printed. I mean, he's in a tricky position, isn't he, Charlotte? Yeah, he's £17 million in, reportedly. That was the advance he got. He was apparently, reportedly, told that the book was too touchy-feely. So he's already had to sort of ramp up the drama. And if he's trying to pull back some of that drama, Penguin Random House might be saying, uh, no thanks, we've got our... Yeah. You know, we're about to go to print. We may, this is as what we say, paid for. This is what we paid for. Yeah. I mean, it's not in their interest to, to reduce the number of scoops in that book. So Harry's in a really tricky situation and he may be under pressure from Meghan to tell his truth. It's just such a fine line to, to tread and also, reportedly, his, do his children's titles are dependent on this because if oh, really? reportedly Charles is waiting till the book comes out before he decides whether he gives Archie and Lilibet a title. I mean, the wow. Prince and Princess title. Well, so if you believe that, there's a lot riding on it. Certainly what is a fact is that there's been no letters patent issued by the King in terms of their um, titles, whereas he made clear that William and Catherine would be Prince and Princess of Wales. But do you think that plays into people saying that they were bang on telling the truth in the Oprah interview that Archie and Lilibet will not be titled in that way? <laughs> I have a lot of views on the on the Oprah interview and so a lot of the claims they made, which were just very contrary to what the the fact was. Mm. The facts were. Um, I mean, the palace have made clear that this is just not. When, when it was first asked about them, when we first, we had a press conference with them, and of course it's one of the first questions we asked as journalists, and they said, look, now is not the time. We're planning for the Queen's funeral, and obviously we're in royal mourning, and this is the kind of stuff that's up for discussion once it's over. That said, I can't believe it. It hasn't been discussed. But the one thing I have to say about this book, and I know this sounds a little bit harsh, but, you know, Harry should have thought about all of this before he did a deal. You know, he did a deal for a book at a time where his grandmother was very elderly and, like all of our grandparents, could have gone at any time. Mm. Um, you know, William said the other week we thought we'd have more time with her. We all think we're going to have more time with them. But it's something that should have come into his decision-making process as to whether to even do this. That's what I, I feel personally. It sounds a bit harsh, but, you know... Unfortunately, you reap what you sow, I think. I've got to be honest, case. way to get me excited about a book, though. I can't <laughs> wait. Goodness me. But let's turn to a couple of your questions now. Patsy C asks, did the Queen have a will or what happens to her personal effects? Do you know, Rebecca? She does have a will, but none of us will ever find out about it because okay. the courts protect them. And there has actually been a, a battle fought by the Guardian newspaper to try and get Prince Philip's will made public because they're saying, why should they be different to any other member of you know of this country um uh, but we won't so she will but we won't ever get to know about it and of course a lot of stuff is ring fenced in terms when it comes to properties in terms of trust there's a lot of personal property of hers that she would be handing down to various family members um but people sometimes forget some of the bigger jewels and things like that she owns are actually not owned by her anyway um they're held in trust by her on behalf of the nation and uh, they're looked after by the Royal Collection Trust, which is a charity. So, you know, there will clearly be some very personal jewels to hang out, hang, hand out, but probably not as many as people might think. I know I've asked you this before, but I still want to know what happens to the wardrobe archive. Do we know yet? We don't. We haven't been told yet. Mm. I mean... Can there... you find out for me, please? I'm obsessed. <laughs> I can't believe that we were... I mean, we have seen some incredible displays at Buckingham Palace of her clothes over the years. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think it's slightly different now we've lost her. I think we won't see something like that for a while because I think people will 
maybe just it feels a little odd displaying her clothes so soon after her, her diet. But I can't believe that this won't come up at some point. So. OK, we'll watch this space. Now, we're on to Susan Forrest now, who asks about all the royal homes, a subject we've discussed before on the show. She says, I'm curious, are the smaller dwellings on those large estates occupied? Could they be rented to help defray the cost of maintaining the primary dwelling? Also, if any of these large homes were to be sold, what would become of them? I can't imagine there are too many buyers that could afford to take on such an expense for a single family home. Well, that's a lot of questions, Susan. Richard, mm. are you up to it? <laughs> well, no, it's all very interesting. I mean, one yeah. of the biggest things is security. That's the problem. They've made efforts in the past to let properties uh, as part of the Kensington Palace complex. Um, but it, it's very tricky, um, loads of security questions that go with that, so they have to be very careful, and that's the same at Windsor. Some in Windsor Great Park, you know, some of those properties are let, um, and this week we've had the first sort of um, sale of a royal property. Is, um, in my column today, we've got the Duke of Gloucester is selling his country home for almost five million pounds. So yes, if any of our steel, viewers a virtual steel. would like to buy a most yeah. historic, beautiful yeah. house that's been in, you know, owned by members of the royal family for decades, then um, they know where to and come. It's going to have some hideous gas bills. But anyway, keep those questions and comments coming in. Our social media handles are at mailplus and our email is palace at mailplus.co.uk. Now, we've got a beautiful montage for you, one we teased about last week called Farewell, Elizabeth the Great. That will take you to the end of the programme this week. My thanks to Rebecca English, Charlotte Griffiths, Richard Eden, and to you for watching. We'll see you on Monday for another special episode of the show. Bye-bye.